Hello. Hey, everybody. It's noon Pacific on a Monday, which means it's content chat time. And today we have a really fun for me and hopefully fun for you too um, edition because we're going to be talking with Wendy Kramer, who um, actually just led the redesign of our consultancy website. So that way she's going to give everybody her perspective on how to know when it's time for a light refresh and when you need to just completely throw caution to the wind and redo all the things like we did because ours was definitely not um, a slight refresh. <laughs> so Wendy, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's such a delight to be here. Thank you. Now, for folks who haven't already met you, either through um, me giving you a billion kudos and talking about you <laughs> on the interweb for the past two months, or who have, you know, haven't worked with you when you were at Neolux Marketing, uh, could you just really kind of quickly share what I think is a pretty unique um, kind of value prop you bring to the page? Because you're not somebody who came from journalism or marketing who kind of fell into web design. So if you could just maybe just share with folks a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, uh, so I hail kind of more from the tech industry um, with a long background in, in web design, but kind of more from the from the programming standpoint, but I've always been kind of a, a creative person as well. So what I've taken time to do is blend my tech skills and my, my love of good aesthetics and creativity uh, to uh, really dive into to web design as a complete end-to-end, -end, meet the tech, meets the aesthetics, uh, while also drawing on my tech experience to build on uh, long-form content creation, good web copy, um, and marketing operations. So bringing that tech to helping people run their business. So yeah, I kind of bring bring all the pieces together uh, in ways that really I think can help my fellow small business owners. What I love about this is you are kind of the ideal um, tech to human translator um, in a very human way uh because humans versus ai is very much in my brain today uh, <laughs> i just you know it's a it's a rarity to have somebody who came from the background of being knee deep in all of the it and engineering um kinds of roles who then made that shift towards creating um you know helping people create and bring to life their business vision through web content and creative design work that still has to rely heavily on all of those tech skills, uh, yeah, which I definitely think, is interesting, I think. Yeah, and it's something that I've actually done a lot throughout my career was sort of end up being that liaison person between kind of different uh, different departments, different factions, the, the, the creative folks that technically don't speak the language of the tech folks and being able to really speak natively to, to both sides has been something that's been really helpful to me all throughout my career and it's a skill that I've really enjoyed honing uh, and I think really, really helps me in what I do now. Could not agree more. Um, with that, let's kind of dive into our topic today and let's just start with the hardest thing first because mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a rip the band-aid off kind of a person. Uh, so how should somebody go about evaluating whether they just need a light refresh for their website or if it is really time to throw away what you have and start over from scratch, which can seem really daunting and scary, but is sometimes necessary. Well, that is such a good question. And this really is the big one. And it oftentimes comes down to how you and your business have evolved and whether your website still really speaks to your brand, to your authentic you image um, or your brand's image, depending on if you're a solopreneur or an agency, or, you know, a larger uh small business. Um, but does, you know, does your website kind of really currently speak to who you feel you are, your business is? And also does it, your content really match what you're doing now? As we saw with your site, Erica, you've come a long way. And since the time when you built your website originally, what you really love to do, who your ideal client has evolved and changed. And so we did the rip and replace because your old website didn't really didn't speak to your brand didn't speak to you as a as a person who has a strong beautiful personality that you just weren't getting on your on your previous site it wasn't showing through wasn't bringing forward your your unique you and also wasn't really speaking to like what you do now how that's changed and so that's really often where we kind of look at that dividing line 
is, you know, have your offerings just slightly shifted and we just need to update some copy or, hey, you're just not ranking real well. We need to kind of rethink some copy to, to get better search rankings. Or has your business changed and everything on your website really speaks to the old you and it's time to, to it's time to just start fresh? Um, you know, sometimes we can just update in place, but really big sweeping design changes, often it's just better to start clean to really rethink the approach. Totally agree with that. Um, and you really hit the nail on the head with, you know, so often when um, people first go into business, you know, you need a website and you put up a website that is your best guess at, you know, answering all the questions that prospective customers will have in like covering all your bases, hitting all those FAQs. And you kind of can set it and forget it because you probably have a <laughs> blog and social media where you're doing more of those just in time, real time communications. Right. And then one day you go back and you look at your website and you go, oh, geez, that doesn't feel like me anymore. And frankly, I don't want to do some of the stuff that um, our website says. It, you know, even if you're talking about a small business um, like a restaurant or any kind of, you know, one on one uh, professional services so frequently stuff is still on that website well beyond its um, actual, you know, longevity um, period, mm -hmm. it's expired content. It's like they'll have links to um, social channels that they haven't used in five years. Mm -hmm. There will be, um, you know, really interesting menu options that haven't been available since before COVID. Right. Things. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that you just have to think about it from the from the end user. Why are they coming to your website? And it's often to gain information. And there's nothing more daunting than thinking you've found what you're looking for only to, to be told, oh, we don't offer that anymore. Whether it's a menu item or a service, oh, we don't do that anymore. Well, then why is it right here on your website on the front page? <laughs> uh, you really don't want to send your customers chasing their tails because then, you know, and the other thing is, is, if half the stuff you do offer isn't on there, your customer can't find you. And yeah. and so, yeah, it's it's so important for the, your website to be informative and really speak to who you're trying to speak to. And oftentimes we don't really have that as dialed in when we first build our website. And as we as we get into what we're doing and we really settle into our, our, our niche, right, um, that information needs to grow with your business. And I think one of the big challenges there is that frequently um, small business owners and solopreneurs will work with an external designer who may do things like create, you know, hard coded pages, who might use a bespoke CMS, who might do things that make it really difficult for the person whose website it is to go in and make those minor edits themselves. So if they get in that kind of a situation where the website is too hard for them to go in and make a small text edit or add something new, then it's just going to stay there until the next time it gets overhauled. Whereas, yeah. you know, that's also to me like something to be thinking about. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Because well. um, <laughs> our web tools have definitely changed a lot over the last yeah. few years. So you know, and I think some of the common things that people hear um, that sound really daunting have become a lot less so, but it's still helpful to have that that initial setup helping hand, having someone be able to, be able to, to get you going. And then, hey, some people want to be completely hands off if you, you know, and, and just have someone come in and do regular updates for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you just need to make a really minor edit or change, it's nice to feel empowered. And I like to make sure that I can support users wherever they're at in that regard, uh, whether it's handoff training or, uh, you know, to being able to dip in here and there to, to, to make more, more up, you know, make updates down the road. I don't want users to feel like they have to, they, they're they locked in. I mean, yes, from a business standpoint, is it better for me to, to, to get paid? <laughs> yes, of course. But my really, my goal is to, to make the tech not suck for, you know, for my clients. And, and if that means being able to then take stuff on themselves after we're done with, with our, with our project, that's totally fine. It's just sort of being able to, to meet people where they're at and, that's, I think, scary for a lot of people to even figure out where that should, you know, what that should look like at the start. Exactly. Um, so, you know, for me, I 
you know, I've been somebody who has worked on a bunch of other people's websites over the years as they've done their overhauls and done all the copywriting. So I had a pretty good idea about, you know, what my structure needed to be, what pages I wanted to have. And I did a mind map. Um, but for people who aren't already doing this kind of thing for a living, I'd love to hear your perspective on some resources um, that people can use to identify the appropriate pages for their websites so that they don't you know, over index on, you know, doing that minimum viable website or over index <laughs> on creating so many pages that you end up with this huge mess of a website or too much to do um, so that it becomes overwhelming. Yeah. And I mean, I think that just sort of the, the, the first thing is really just sitting down and, and thinking about yourself and your business. And what Again, what's the job of your website? Who are you trying to talk to and what are you trying to tell people? And so sort of that first thing is just really sitting down and thinking through what do you do and how many words does it take to to tell somebody what you do? How different, you know, do you need a multiple multiple service pages? Do you need just one that kind of talks through variations on a, on a service? Things like that. And so some of that is just sort of the, the mental exercises of just sort of sitting down and making an outline and just kind of thinking through your website and your content. But this is, again, where working, not working alone can be really helpful um, in kind of finding that right balance for not just the technical SEO purposes, but also just are your customers more likely to go one or two or three pages deep or they just they just need everything on the front page and so it's really understanding your target audience your business kind of segment uh and working with someone who can kind of hold your hand on that and sometimes that's just hey it's going around and looking at some websites that you really like and people you respect and going this this right here makes sense to me versus oh this is just too complicated um and, and think about that how does your ideal client feel if you feel overwhelmed by somebody's website how will your customer feel uh if your website looked like that versus something a little bit more streamlined but trying to cram too much information on a page if things are different enough that they need to speak for themselves is also not, you know, it doesn't help people find what they're looking for either. If you have to scroll and scroll and scroll to find the one paragraph that mentions the thing you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, a lot of this is just going to come down to having a guide to hold your hand, uh, taking a look and are saying, hey, what are my peers doing? What do I like and not like when I interact with the Internet? <laughs> like, I know it's uh, one of Alex's pet peeves to have pages that scroll endlessly. Yeah. Uh, so that's something I kept in mind, because on the one hand, I wanted a little bit of scroll because I wanted mm -hmm. pages that kind of had, you know, compartments for things and hit all the bases without having everything be like having jump downs or anything like that. Um, but I, it's also important to understand, you know, where do you need a whole page to talk about something versus, right. you know, trying to cram all the things on the same page. Well, and I think this is where the templates that we used that, that are your templates and, and speaking of resources, this is a great piece of it, touting to your resources page. This is a, this is a great one for people to, to draw on because as you kind of fill out that template, if you realize that you're, that you can't figure out what your page's focus is, you're trying to put too much information on that page. Exactly. Or if, as you're filling it out, you feel like you've already said this three times, you probably have multiple pages that probably could really be one. Um, and so that right there as just sort of, a, a, you know, going through and kind of going through a template that helps you understand thinking about what's the focus of this page? What are we trying to say? And, and then working through those kind of those prompts to build out, you know, to start, you know, kind of building the skeleton of what will become the copy is a really great way to sort of get that sense of am I am I am I going too heavy with pages or am I going too light uh, with if this page has no focus or I want to have 80 different keywords for this page, you're probably trying to put too many things there. Uh, so well, that's actually yeah. what's kind of fun with using an AI tool is you can ask it what, you know, what am I, what have I missed here? What have I not included? Absolutely. But you can also say, you know, if I was a person, you know, looking for whatever it is, you know, that you provide in this market, what would you expect to find on the website? And the AI can give you that like skeleton of your site map. And I think that yeah. can be really helpful. Um, Agreed. And love... this is a really great use for AI, for sure. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments about what is and isn't good use <laughs> of AI, but that's a really great one to just say, hey, help me think about the structure. What am I missing? What am I, you know, what's one what of the gaps or, you know, is this repetitive? <laughs> totally. 
And I love this comment we just got in from um, Derek, um, Derek Pilly, who is a longtime content chat um, participant back from our Twitter days. And he said that, you know, a strategy that he has used in the past is really with, you know, doing those design kickoffs, doing that brainstorming where you ask yes. them, ask the client everything that they want to achieve as an organization. And you keep that up as kind of like, you know, your um, vision board. So that way you make sure that everyone can kind of come back to it. And then eventually they do um, have that prioritization, which I think is important too, because, you know, you can try to do all the things with mm -hmm. the website. You can try to do all the things on these pages, but you do eventually have to look at things and go, is this too much? And do we need a new section? Do we need a new page? Or, you know, is there a different kind of content that we need because just because it's a website doesn't mean that every piece of content is a web page. You know, right, you might exactly have, some stuff might be resource. an article. Yeah. yeah. You might have a resource center. You might have a knowledge base. You might have links to templates and things. So yeah. it's always so important to make sure you're using the right uh, format because just like there are mm -hmm. some meetings that should be an email, there are some <laughs> things that should not be a web page. And yeah, we all into those sites. Yeah, right tool for the job for sure. Now, Derek really hits the nail on the head. And this kind of comes back to talking about what is the job of your website? Who are you talking to? And yeah, and the goals of the organization are a big part of that. So that is, you know, such a, um, you know, insightful and very, very accurate um, representation of kind of that. What is your website? What is, you know, what is the point of your website? And, and, and is to help accomplish goals for the organization, to help bring people in, whether it's um, providing information, creating lead generation, you know, however that, wherever that fits in your customer journey and part of your funnel, you have goals as a business and, and your website really needs to, to be a relevant piece that is cohesive. <laughs> And so, yeah, the starting, start big and trim back. We'll definitely let, get all those ideas out on the table, really think through and then figure out, yeah, kind of a, what needs to be consolidated? What needs to just be cut? What's a different kind of content? Um, you know, what's missing? <laughs> yeah. And then once you have <clears throat> all of that kind of understanding about what you're trying to accomplish, what content, what kinds of content you want to have on the site, then you need to start thinking about what kind of a content management system is going right. to work for what you do. And I'll tell you that every single client I've worked with has had something different. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever possible, I've tried to move people over to WordPress if uh, because it's something <laughs> I'm super comfortable with, but it's not always the right tool for everybody. So I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, some of the um, CMS tools that you work with most frequently and, you know, which ones are kind of the right fit for which kind of, um, which kind of business and which kind of, I guess, for lack of a better way of thinking about it, uh, technology user? Because, you know, there's some folks that are like, we always use the like your mom kind of thing, <laughs> um, technology right. user. And then there are people who are okay with going in and futzing around and aren't worried that they're going to break things. So kind of yeah. love your scoop about CMS. Yeah. So I, um, I am a big, big uh, proponent of WordPress. That is my, that is definitely my happy place, but it isn't the right fit for everybody. Um, but I've worked across, you know, I've built websites in HubSpot's internal CMS. I've built sites on Wix, Squarespace, Weebly, you know, a lot of these kind of meant to be more for beginner tools. And I think that there, are, I mean, all of these services are trying to add more integrations, but with all of them, no, you know, it's cheap to host here, except as soon as you want to have any of their marketing tools, suddenly it's much more expensive. And the thing that I often tell people is if you have a lot of things that you need to integrate into your website, if you have a lot of, if, if part of your web, your website is part of a greater workflow, WordPress is probably going to be where you want to be. If your website is really just a brochure and it just needs to be one or two pages, it's just very simple and, and it's contact form, maybe you're a performer and you just need to have your, how to, you know, a sample of your work and some booking information, then you might be, you know, it might be easier and, and make more sense to use, um, you know, some of these other types of platforms, but it's, it's oftentimes comes down to, do you already have a website? Where's it at? And is it doing the job it's supposed to be doing? Or is it 
underpowered or overpowered for your needs, um, or you're starting from scratch. And then it's really about, again, going back to what are your organizational goals? What is your goals for your business? How much automation do you need? How many integrations to other things do you need? Do you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about? And this is all flashing question marks, because that's going to inform us about where we say, hey, this is, I think, where you should build this. Um, you know, some people Squarespace uh, or similar might be a really great way for them to set up a really simple online store, whereas WordPress with WooCommerce might be really overwhelming for their management needs. But if you're running a really heavy traffic, big e-commerce space, Squarespace is likely not going to keep up with your needs, right? So there's that, you know, how, how big or small are you? How self-managed do you need to be? How many of you are there? Is it just you or do you have a team uh, that can kind of inform a lot on on kind of the this, you know, this idea that go big or go home isn't isn't ever the way I see it. It's really got to be the right fit. And and sometimes it's, hey, this is what fits now and recognize that this is going to grow and change later and realize that you're just going to have to expect to refresh your website in a, in a couple of years. But if you're just getting started, sometimes you do just something really simple and then you can grow onto a different platform later or start simple on a platform that can grow with you. And that's, again, what I tend to like about WordPress is you can start very simple uh, and and grow it from there, but that can be overwhelming and daunting for some people. So, you know, and if you're not maintaining a blog and things like that, not doing a lot of long form content, then something that is just a more simple kind of point and click website builder may be the better choice. And I'm not gonna push somebody onto something bigger and more complicated if it's not, you know, if that doesn't actually serve them in their business. Because again, the idea is to make the tech easy, to make, you know, <laughs> trying and I think that some people will always be like oh I'm going to sell them on the, the biggest most expensive website I can and that's again just never my approach um it's not it's not about how much money I can charge you for helping a website it's about giving a website that actually does work for you in your business and so those CMS tools are going to again it comes on doing that discovery sitting down and talking about what your needs really look like and what you think your needs are going to be like in six months to a year two years um, and what you think your growth arc is going to be. So people expect to grow really slow and they may be in the right fit for their initial website for, for, for a few years. Other people are expecting to grow rapidly and they need to be in something that will grow with them quickly. So knowing your goals, knowing your growth arc um, are, are really big indicators to how uh, to kind of how to choose those things. Um, and also, again, comes down to how many other tools you think you need to have plugged into your website. Where does it sit in that journey? Um, is your website your primary source of lead generation? Or are you flowing people to your website further along? Like by the time they get to your website, they're they're almost, you know, they're a warm lead versus, hey, they're going to find me through Google and come to my website completely cold. I think those are all really important considerations. And, you know, that all is so important before you start writing anything <laughs> to know mm -hmm. the answer to those questions and to be starting with your objectives and your why. Um, and similarly, then once you have figured out, okay, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here are all the pages I want to create. Well, you need to get started, but you also need to figure out how you're going to manage the process to make sure that you have that um, great working collaboration and of course, in full transparency, when I do these, when I'm brought in to rewrite somebody's website because they're rebranding, there's a project manager involved and they're managing all the things for all the people. But of course, when you're talking about solopreneurs and small businesses, you don't have a person on staff usually whose job is managing projects. So I'd love your thoughts on, you know, some approaches to make sure that you do um, ensure that every page and every brand detail is actually accounted for in a way that, um, you know, that's easy <laughs> and yeah. kind of transparent for both sides. Yeah. And that's really comes down to just good collaborative tools. Um, even something as simple as working within, uh, you know, Google Docs and just creating a shared workspace to have all the assets in one place, but then to sit down and create, hey, let's create that outline. This is a, our, our high level navigation outline. This tells us once we've done that discovery, we've trimmed things back, we're ready to actually start, uh, you know, kind of picking this apart. We need that outline that says this is what the, the, the overarching structure of the website is going to look like. And that allows us then to track where we are with each of those pages. Um, the templates for building out those pages, again, uh, very collaborative in a way for us to kind of check things off and, and say, hey, this is done. 
So even just, yeah, just a simple, just checklist, uh, a mood board so that we can get those, make sure we're really capturing that brand identity really, you know, and figuring out, hey, is your current branding really where you're at? Or, and this is what we want to bring forward to your website, or has your branding changed? And do we need to kind of sit down and go through that process to make those adjustments or to, to pull in those new, those newer brand elements? And so just something as simple as, yeah, just a, you know, with you, you and I, what we used, what I just did was a, just a Google Slides that just created a nice mood board, let us kind of pick those, you know, make sure we knew the colors that we liked, had the kind of design elements that we wanted. And again, then it's just easy to go in and comment. It's easy to go in and, 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 and ask for changes until we know, hey, this is perfect and I love it. Then we can start seeing an action on the, as we go through and start building. And we can always say, hey, you know what? I thought that I liked that yellow, but really I like blue. <laughs> That was one of the really good uh, later yep. stage changes, and mm-hmm. and I'll credit um, I'll credit Canva Pro actually for helping me sometimes with those kinds of um, decisions sure. because when um, you use Canva Pro, they have the brand kit section where you upload your logo, you can put in all of your colors, you can put in your uh, preferred fonts, all that kind of good stuff, and then you get this nice little you know, a little brand rectangle that shows you your branding and it makes it really easy for you to kind of go, oh, yeah, that was a good idea and I don't like it now. Um, or, oh. hey, this is perfect. <laughs> I hit it out of the park. Yeah. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, from a bang for its buck standpoint, using Canva can be so helpful just Absolutely. because it'll help you visualize the stuff too. Love yeah, that. 100%. And that's a, such a great as far as like tools to help with the process, being able to bring in something where, hey, you upload your your your, your logo and a couple of graphics, and it can all kind of automatically detect, hey, here are the colors that are part of this. And you can kind of mm-hmm. say, hey, I really love these colors and bring them together into, yeah, into that brand kit. It is really nice to just sort of have, another, again, another really great use for uh, sort of what the computer can see uh, so that we don't have to guess. <laughs> exactly. Um, So with that in mind, you know, what are some of the kind of essential planning steps that um, people should take before starting a website overhaul process? Yeah, this is the big one. Um, So if your website already exists and you're ready to do an overhaul, the, the, the really, the, 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 the really the big ones are looking at your brand Um, again, kind of is, does your website reflect your, your brand as you, you feel like it is go look at all of your other spaces, go look at your socials. What does your brand look like on, on Instagram, on, on, on Facebook, on anywhere else, you know, on LinkedIn, when you go back to your website, do they, do they look alike? Cause your brand is likely evolving faster on social than it is on something more static like your website. And then it's time to sit down and really look at your content at the existing pages you have, what is relevant, what's not, what's new, what's, what is still current to your business and just needs maybe some, some content massaging and what's just completely, this isn't, this isn't who we are, what we do anymore. Um, you know, and Hey, this is perfect. I don't want to lose this chunk of wording because it's perfect. You know, there's some stuff you definitely keep some stuff you want to just modify. Other stuff needs, needs to be cut. And this is also a great time if you do have a blog to sit down and do that audit of, of what content do you have out there? What articles are irrelevant entirely, need to be updated? What are your gaps? Uh, you know, what content, what new content should you be creating that really speaks more to what, you know, who you are and what you do now? And so it's that, it's that big audit process of understanding where are you at and where do you want to be? Uh, and again, coming back, like Derek said, understanding your organizational goals uh, is a big piece of that too. From the branding side and the organizational goals, what are you trying to accomplish? How has your business changed? Have your business goals changed since you built your website? And maybe they're the same, but they may have changed again as your target, you know, market has changed, or who your ideal client is, or just entirely if your services entirely have evolved. I know mine have. Um, you know, in fact, hilariously, my own website is actually down right now because I'm going through a big DNS change because I'm moving my website to a new host and having some hiccups. So don't uh, don't try to go to my website today. <laughs> well, the recap will uh, still put the link with a uh, with yeah. a note that will be in your soon. So. Yeah, if you're watching this live, don't uh, yeah. But uh, if you're watching this on follow-up, hopefully the issue will be resolved. Um, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's the shoemaker's children. We understand because again, I'd been working on you know the impetus for us for doing this major overhaul was after having done my 
fifth major website um, copywriting project. And by major, I mean 120 really meaty pages of content. So rewriting yeah. companies, you know, an entire website, Our taking whole you know, <laughs> huge project. That's what I was just like, it feels terrible to have a website that does not in fact talk about this being an area I specialize in because, you know, brand voice is something that I love and I've thought a lot about and I've taught lots of people how to define and differentiate their brand voice. And that's precisely why I also do all of this kind of copywriting and get hired to do it for folks because I'm good at being able to internalize a brand voice and write to it. Yet I didn't have any of that information on my own website. Right? No, you're a genius at that. And that's something that really, yeah, you want to be, You that needs to be front and center for sure, because that is an area where you're very gifted. And, you know, for me, with the evolution of my business, when I first started back in 2018, kind of ahead of COVID, um, I was offering a lot more um, pure tech services. And as we moved into COVID and I kind of got pulled into the marketing world, a little bit by accident, but sort of as being because I had that subject matter expert, I got that chance to really start building content and writing from that technical perspective and really got a chance to see that I was was good at, again, doing that translational work, writing for different audiences, whether this, you know, from the perspective of the C-suite, talking to the C-suite, talking to engineers or from engineers, you know, trying to speak out to your yeah. general kind of buying audience um, and being able to, to really sound like I know I understand the technology because I do, but also still have that not dry, this is an engineering doctor. Having that humanity <laughs> and personality. Exactly. Um, you know, but my website was still talking a lot about offering kind of those more hard, those, uh, you know, hard tech services, but I just, my happy place isn't doing desktop support as much anymore. And if somebody calls me with a question, I'll help them if I can, but that's not my primary business anymore. My primary business that doesn't is bring you joy. much more the, uh, you know, the business automation pieces, the website, the marketing operations, uh, and then talking about it because technology is fun uh, and being able to kind of bring that perspective. And I love kind of being able to have that weird, crazy trifecta of, of things. But yeah. My own website wasn't even speaking to who I was anymore and, and realizing Hey, it's I've got to do this for me too. Uh, so I get to caught kind up of doing it for other people, and I forget that my website was sitting out there, out <laughs> of date, and you know, and it's it's you know, it was a good kick in my pants to be like, you know what, I need to take my own advice. <laughs> and I love that you you know move forward with just taking your site down. And you know, similarly, when we were starting the process for our site. I sunsetted some sections of the website. I took stuff down and redirected because, you know, you have to decide, is it better to have outdated content out there or is it better to have no content for a little bit? And yeah. depending upon how much time you're spending, um, you know, with it and just, you know, what you think through the impact of AI could be on having outdated content out there, that represents mm -hmm. you in a way that's no longer accurate or valid, you do have to really weigh some of those things. Because um, yeah. do you want to be training a whole generation of AI tools that you are somebody who specializes in something that you hate doing and want to transition away from? <laughs> that would be dreadful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not to say that I hate doing it. It's just not what I want to offer as a service. I still I still do really love just kind of holding people's hand with the tech. The area I want to focus in is just a little different, you know, a little more specific than it used to be. Exactly. Um, you know, but yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I mean, and it wasn't necessarily my intention for my website to completely go down. Uh, it was just a little bit of, uh, of bad time. <laughs> Well, I'm going to come right out and say, it. you know, one of the things that was a big change with my new website is I didn't mention anything about doing, you know, crisis communications or um, doing anything in financial services, because while that was my past life at Schwab and I was great at it, I helped with all sorts of merger and acquisition communications and all sorts of you know, anytime there was like a blizzard or <laughs> natural disaster, I was the one who wrote all that stuff. That is not what I want to spend all my time doing. So I don't put that out there as a service because I don't want people to be like, oh, cool. She does this thing. Let's have her, 
you know, let's talk to her about it. Cause I don't want to be spending time talking about why I would like them to talk to a friend of mine who does that instead. Right. That's, <laughs> that doesn't help anybody. So. Yeah. Um, the immediate, if, if you hit my website and I immediately have to refer you out, then my website isn't talking to my, to my ideal client. And if that's the same thing, if your website, if you're constantly having to refer out because you're hit, getting hits for things that either you just don't feel like you specialize in anymore or just don't want to do anymore and want to hand them off to somebody because that's their passion, uh, then yeah, then that's definitely, again, that can, that, how do you know if it's time for a refresh? If you're referring a lot of your clients elsewhere, then your website's likely not talking to who you really want it to be talking to. Um, and same thing and if a lot of referrals really are coming form. in hand over hand, which word of mouth is great, but if nobody's ever coming in via your website, it might be time to think about is your website actually accomplishing, you know, doing its job for your, for your business. Totally. And before we move on, I, I will also note one of the things that we did that was really um, different is instead of having a general contact form, we put together um, a, a contact form that changes based on, you know, who the person is, you know, that's coming to the site and what they're looking to do. So that yep. way we don't overwhelm people with a bunch of irrelevant questions, yeah. but that we also make sure that people have thought a little bit about what they want to do. And for yeah. example, we don't want to take on um, content clients who don't have a content strategy unless they're looking to have us create a content strategy and then help them with content that, um, you know, maps to it because, right. you know, no more random acts of content is not just a slogan. It is how I feel. It's like yeah. incredibly important to me. It's so, you know, our form, which even though that might seem like such a small thing, it's really to help make sure that we're attracting the right people to us. Because yep. if you're annoyed that I'm asking you if you have a content strategy or not, when you fill in that form, then you probably don't want to work with me because guess what I'm going to ask you the first time we talk about is what's your content strategy? Can you share it with right. me? And if they go, well, I don't have one. Well, we already, we already like, kind of did that. So is that what right you're there. looking for? <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, no, I really loved building uh, that form. And this, again, this is sort of one of those opportunities to kind of plug why WordPress can be great, because as opposed to having to hand program a really complicated form that then only I can maintain, we did that through a plugin that was in fact free. Uh, it's a, it's a, and it does some really powerful, cool stuff. Um, and just but based on selecting, hey, what kind of service are you looking for? Click the, the radio button and it, you know, and the fields appear for that service. So that, yeah, you, you know exactly what they're looking for when they come and you get the relevant information. And if when they go to, to, to email you, they don't see a service that matches what they're looking for, then it might be a good sign to say, hey, this isn't actually my right fit. I'm looking for somebody who does something else. So it also kind of helps do that, 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 that pre-screen helps customers know if they're in the right place and it helps you get the information you need so that you can jump right in and address what they need and sell them on how awesome and skilled you are by, by having that ability to, to immediately speak to them where they're at. I love that. And it was just, it was such a win for me. Um, yeah. So of course, you know, even though we were sharing all the things that we love and that went well, you know, there's always some glitches. There's always sure. things like auto updates of plugins, hosing your site. Um, that happens. <laughs> that always happens, yeah. which is why okay. don't do that. Just don't. Make sure that you're comfortable with updating them manually because then you can do them one by one and it really makes it less likely that you'll have to do a restore from backup. Yeah, so, that was, you know, that was a unfortunate little moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's me starting first with one of the hurdles you can have uh, when you go through this process. But maybe Absolutely. even just backing up a little bit further into kind of the you know website redesign process. What are some of the common hurdles you see folks have um, when they're in, you know, trying to work through the process of updating their website and, you know, what are some ways that you've seen that they can kind of mitigate the pain and suffering of going through the process? Yeah, I mean, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds uh, and get, get really bogged down in, in, in the details. Um, and that's, you know, that's where we have to sort of say, hey, let's zoom back out. You know, start, start high, then get more specific. Again, let's get everything on the table and then to start to, to weed it out, get it into a general shape that makes sense, then start digging into the details. Because if you go for the details first, 
everything's interconnected and it starts to feel so overwhelming, you got to have a map first, then start to, to, to trace that out. Um, and so I think a lot of people, they just, they, they start from the wrong focus and that's getting down into trying to think about those details before thinking about just, again, talking about the goals, the high level, what are we trying to do and who are we trying to talk to? And so that that's always going to be the way to kind of mitigate that is to say, let's stop and zoom out. You know, let's bring it back to the brand and the goals. Um, and does this align with, with both? Does this make sense in the context? Or is what we're trying to do here maybe another piece of content <laughs> or, uh, you know, just something that doesn't really belong in this space? Um, so I think, again, kind of keeping those those collaborative tools, having a checklist, keeping things so we can kind of track where we are, but building those checklists, building those maps is a big help to kind of mitigating some of that overwhelm because it just allows you to kind of build it again. You don't build a house uh, by by trying to decorate the walls before before you put up drywall. You build the frame first, then you <laughs> put in all the details. Uh, and so you have to just think about it like that. We're going to build the high level structure and then we're gonna then we're gonna zoom in and then we can worry about the finer details when we get there. Um and so that's that's a big one. The other thing is when people just sort of they they want to put everything on all oh, oh I love this graphic over here and I want this, but is it telling your brand story? Is it doing something for uh for what you're trying to communicate? So that's the other thing is people sometimes get a little overexcited and want to, to have too many elements. And so sometimes there's a little bit of just needing to, again, kind of narrow things down, um, pick your favorites, what, and then think again about your brand and your goals. Does this tell a story? Does this speak to this? <laughs> Derek, yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a, again, it's always keeping those goals and your, and your, your brand in, in mind with everything. Yeah. That cute little animated, uh, char cartoon characters cute, but if your brand has nothing to do with your brand or nothing to do with your content or doesn't really help you tell the story you want to tell, then maybe that's not, uh, maybe that's something that's cute to put on your Facebook page or on Instagram, but maybe it doesn't go on your website. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's a lot of times those are the hiccups are just people wanting to cram too much, especially when thinking about design, it's easy to get excited. Oh, I found a hundred graphics. We don't want a hundred <laughs> graphics. Or just getting lost in the details before uh, before really getting that high level, you know, again, zoom out, then 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 narrow focus in uh, as we go and we get to those finer details once we actually get that, you know, we know what the website structure is. Okay, now we're gonna structure this page. Now we're gonna really you know, what does this page need to say? And that's going to tell us how to structure it. Then we can get into the finer details of how is it designed? How does it look? And what specifically does it say? But again, it's just, it's, it's stepwise. Um, and I think that's the biggest way to avoid some of the biggest pitfalls is just sort of, again, taking things uh, one at a time and never losing sight of those, those focal points. You know what the horizon is, but you got to start from back here. <laughs> So Derek just has like all the best examples today. So I love that he says that the parks and recreation episode where they did the city's website redesign is one of his favorite examples of this. They added a game with the panda bear to the website that distracted everyone from the content. And yeah. that's, such, that's <laughs> hilarious, but we've all been to those websites that like you get to the website and all of a sudden music starts playing or there's an autoplay video that takes over your screen and you're like, why, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> don't, 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 you know, some of those things seem really cool, but really if you think about how you use the internet and you go to a web page that does that and it's, super, you go to click on something, all of a sudden something pops up and now you've clicked on something you didn't mean to, or now suddenly, yeah, this giant video is playing don't you hate that? Like, and so think about how you like to use the internet and that's going to tell you a lot about what you should and shouldn't have on your own website. Um, because oftentimes our ideal clients are, are, are some, I mean, not always, but are often people who somewhat like ourselves. And so we can use kind of ourselves as the barometer and when in doubt, you know, do the mom test. Hand, hand people who, you know, maybe aren't super tech savvy or maybe who feel more like your ideal client and ask them to navigate a few different example websites that maybe you think are cool but aren't sure if they are and have them tell you what feels informative and what feels helpful and what they absolutely hate. 
and if, if you can't figure for yourself whether it's <laughs> but yeah i mean a lot of times we can just think about how much we like or don't like navigating different kinds of things on the internet and that can tell us a whole lot about the kind of do's and don'ts <laughs> and you know the one um, tactical thing i would add to all of this mm -hmm. is make sure you pick a good time for when you're doing the switch over for your website if you're doing an yeah. overhaul because i'll tell you that frequently folks do things like pick a holiday weekend you know when they think to themselves oh there'll be less traffic during this time frame or something like that but the thing is is if you pick a holiday for example it may be harder to get technical support from uh -huh. your, um, you know, from the company that hosts you or from the developers of a plugin or all of those kinds of things because yeah. they might be closed. Yep. Also, um, some holidays actually could mean that you'd be getting more traffic to your website. So having those hiccups that happen as your DNS is rolling out and those pages are getting locally cached and all these technical things that you don't need to know about until people yeah. start freaking out <laughs> that your website looks weird. Um, maybe you didn't want to do that when everybody was at home staring at the Internet. Yeah, uh, and that is so. yeah. The cut, <laughs> picking your cut over time is always this big kind of scary thing because you're going to experience some downtime, and there's just there's just no two ways around it. That's just how the internet works, and and that's not something that you're, that any service provider, whether you're your your website designer and developer or your host, can do anything about. That is literally just kind of part of the backbone of the internet, and and it takes time for those changes to to really propagate outward, and so. Yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, we'll do this in the middle of the night. But that means that you and your developer <laughs> and everyone needs to be awake in the middle of the night. Whereas sometimes the better plan is just to, to recognize that you're going to have a, a, a day that's going to be a little bumpy. And you message, message ahead of time. Hey, you know, we're so excited. We're going to be relaunching our website. Expect downtime on such and such date between these hours. Hey, coming soon. It's coming up. Hey, tomorrow you may experience problems with our website. Hey, today we're cutting our website over. Like having a communication plan out to your customer base can really kind of mitigate a lot of the the oh no. And then people know what to expect and they're excited to come see your new website because then you can do the big yay and we're live, you know, and everyone can celebrate with you. Um, you know, if it's gonna make or break your business to 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 lose a couple of clicks during that cutover. You know, I mean, most people aren't aren't going to actually lose their shirt. <laughs> yes, does it does it suck that some incidental people coming in from from Google might you know get going you know not see what you want them to see? It, but it's usually for such a short amount of time, and it's worth it to do it oftentimes during the day when everybody who can be part of that process is awake and present. Because things do sometimes go wrong, and yep. you know, I mean, migrating from staging into production. Um, we saw that with, 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 you know, just moving your website pre-launch that stuff that should have imported properly really didn't. And so we had to go back through and do some cleanup. Luckily that's yep. pre pre-launch, but that was, that was work we had to redo. Things do go wrong, especially when you have to migrate from, from a one hosting area to another, from staging into a production area. Some of these things just aren't as seamless as we'd like them to be. And so, and so just baking in some time for that, being prepared for those things, um, you know, having some contingency planning, uh, but also just knowing this isn't going to take five minutes. It's going to take maybe five hours. Like yep. hopefully it takes five minutes to press the buttons, but it may take a few hours for all of the iron, you know, to iron out all the wrinkles and, and notice that, you know, different people on different browsers are experiencing different things. Even though we yep. tested that sometimes you're still <laughs> what people see in the wild is surprising even though we thought that we checked all those things we did all the, the triple checks on yours and we still had a few people report and going hey this looks weird or hey this doesn't work and then we went and we figured out why so it was totally yeah. helpful exactly you know and then those are those easy fixes if you cut over in the middle of the night everybody gets tired and goes to bed and then you've got people stumbling all over all the mistakes at times when no one's available do it during the day have you know have that communication plan and be right there ready to fix things uh as as people find them and it really just shortens that duration of when things are kind of funky but if you're also doing that big messaging plan 
really letting like marketing it, using it as an exciting thing, then people know a to expect a change and that things might be a little bit weird and people are excited to kind of participate in the process as opposed to being like, oh man, their website's all messed up. <laughs> I can't trust them. They're like, oh right, they just launched a new website. Oh, I found a bug. Yay, you know, I helped. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Most people, most people kind exactly. of feel participatory in the process. And and it's a great way to then kind of uh you know, nurture some of those those connections, uh, which I think are so important. So, <laughs> you Before can get I let you go, though, I have one... to a positive. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, though, I have one last thing that I want yeah. to hear from you on, which is, you know, your perspectives on how to design a website that reflects not just SEO best practices, which at this point is table stakes and old hat. It's, you know, if you're not doing that, I don't know what to say, right. um, but also thinking about AI powered search because now AI is being used both, you know, as, you know, part of specific search engines people are already using, but people are also using those AI tools to search for information or to search for definitions or search for um, citable sources to point people yeah. to. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Well, and this is really, um, yeah, we've long since emerged from a world where we recognize that SEO is so important for our websites, but we've all been to those web pages where it just feels like you can just, you're reading the same keywords over and over again, but you don't, you didn't learn anything. Uh, you know, keyword stuffing has also become an, an, an old hat thing and it's useless. We all hate to just land on pages that say nothing, but they're highly searchable. And so really the important thing with with doing a good website refresh and looking at your copy. Yeah, you wanna know what the page's focus is, but you need to, to tell a story. You need to say something, you need to be saying the important pieces. If you think about what a machine is gonna read, what do you want it to come away with? You want it to know who you are, what you're an expert in and how you do what you do, why you're special. And then your pages need to speak that. It needs to, it's not just about how many times can I say, content marketing specialist in, in my, my page about content marketing, right? It's really about talking about how you do, what you do, what's magical about it, what's different, so that whether a person or a machine is reading it, it can strip out all the cruft and say, and consolidate down to this person does this thing and here's why they're so good at it. <laughs> um, and, that, and that really is, you want to speak to the fact that real people are reading your website but yeah if you had to say now summarize this page in two sentences what is it that one or two sentences really saying are you is that web page actually telling that consolidated story in a cohesive way so no and that's also that. where real words that's also where like content hubs come in because ai is looking for that validation and that proof that you are who and what you say you are right. so if you have all these pages that say you do these things but you have no other content on your site that says anything about them. You have no social proof that you do these things. There's no one yeah. linking back to you using those keywords to your content. Then the AI is going to go, this person is full of baloney. Yeah. Um, no, that, and, that you. <laughs> and consistency of language across your website as well. Really being able to speak about, you know, about these things kind of on more than one page as necessary, um, especially for those sort of, very specific areas that, um, you know, you're, you're kind of your broad areas of expertise. You can be very specific on, on specific pages, but there's going to be certain things that you want to make sure are, are very consistent across your website. And yeah, definitely make sure you have good backlinks, good links across to your own uh, long form content, making sure that, uh, you know, yeah, can all those pieces are connected, but consistency is, is absolutely, uh, a key thing there as well for kind of building that whole site uh, view from the from the robots. <laughs> well, I think we do have time for a few questions and we already have one. So I'm going to tee up Yay. this one from Derek. Um, so Derek's asking, you know, do you typically build in time for user acceptance testing or do your clients not typically have the bandwidth to handle that? Which I think is a great question. Yeah, I, I definitely like to. I certainly want to have someone other than me go through all the pages, click all the things. Um, but yeah, if they've kind of got, if you've got, um, again, that kind of that mom tester, you know, having somebody who doesn't know what we're up to and just saying, hey, I want you to go through and take a look at this and tell me 
Do you find anything that's broken? Does it make sense? Uh, and getting that feedback can be really, really helpful. So yeah, I do try to bake in time to do um, to do good testing and to try to, uh, you know, again, meet the customer where they're at as far as how much time they have to do that. But I don't want to launch a site that's half baked. Uh, and I and I really want to impress upon my my clients that taking the time to do to do that testing. Um, and also, yeah, to to, to if they're if, you know to get a chance to kind of field test if we have the opportunity to field test their site amongst uh, you know some a, a trusted subset of their audience, and that's always. Uh, I think a, a bonus. And if they don't have the bandwidth for it, they don't have the time for it, then we're going to do our best and we'll we'll kind of adjust as we go. But uh, but yes, I, I I I impress upon everybody the importance of let's do the if nothing else, then do all the click testing. But uh, if we can field test it with uh, with some trusted folks, let them kind of go and poke through and give us some initial impressions or let us know if anything feels like it's missing or confusing. That gives us that chance to do a little bit of cleanup before we launch. And I'm going to share um, Derek's follow up to this. But first, I want to say, when I was at Charles Schwab, I all the projects I did during the 10 years I was there were all around digital. So, you know, I was on the B2B side, and I worked whenever we had a website launch, whenever we had new tools, I was always part of all of that stuff. And while my role officially was doing the marketing, communications, content kind of thing, I was always part of the, the UAT testing, because I have not just that attention to detail that is sometimes annoying. I'm also really good at breaking things. I have broken, I don't know how many <laughs> websites, input forms, or what have you, by just interacting with them differently or being the only Mac user in an environment that is expecting you to be a PC user. So I was really good at breaking things, documenting them, and being able to, you know, replicate my errors that I've seen. Um, and that brings up something that, um, that Derek experienced that we all have too, which is, you know, for enterprise projects, he found that they'd have to train their people to do the user acceptance testing, which seemed like it's defeating the purpose. But right. it's so funny and true because Derek, to that point, frequently people don't know how to articulate the problem that they are having they don't think to take a screenshot of the error and the URL of the page it's happening on. They don't know that they need to say, hey, this happened while I was using my iPhone or versus this happened using my Windows phone, <laughs> which you're like, well, we know why the, the problem happened. No offense to Windows phone users who might be watching <laughs> on their Windows phone right now. I'm just saying that, you know, that's kind of, obvious to us that you need to know that information in order to give the feedback that you found a bug or that there's a problem. But people don't always understand um, what is valuable. Instead, there's like, this doesn't work. And yeah, it's got to be the worst. <laughs> early in my uh, early in my tech career, I <clears throat> worked uh, running beta programs for software. And uh, yeah, you knew the people who were really uh, who'd been participating in the betas for a long time and they gave you, yeah, here's, here's, here's my client version. Here's my, my OS version. They knew all the information to give you, including here's a screenshot of the error, et cetera. And here's the steps to reproduce it. Uh, and the people who were like, got an error when I clicked on a button. <laughs> <laughs> and the there's a reason the I've been in many, many alpha <laughs> and betas for a specific large company's uh, video games, because they only have, you know, a few Mac users who can do that because they're not, you know, they're not people who've had that background where they've done that and who will give the, you know, huge troubleshooting error reports and know where to pull stuff out of their system files to say, here's exactly the error that happened and why. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's it's hard, but it saves you a lot of grief at the yeah. end of the day when you find that some of these things that you thought were going to be amazing and beautiful and cool actually break everything. Yeah. And, you know, for, for most websites, if someone can kind of give you a, you know, rough sense of what, the, you know, where they're on the phone versus the PC or, you know, versus the desktop uh, and kind of what page they were on, you know, usually with, with, with front end web stuff, you can usually figure out what they're seeing or what's going on. But yeah, it can, some people can occasionally, especially if you've got more uh, more technical integrations to your site, the more things that can potentially go wrong and there's just more error points until you can run into those weirder 
oh, you have to click in this order to get this weird error message to generate because of the way this plugin is programmed. And so sometimes yeah. that can be a that can be an adventure in debugging in more complex websites for sure. And sometimes you just won't find those click paths until you let a lot of people kind of just at, have at it. <laughs> and so yeah. again, it's yeah, even beyond, uh, even with all the UAT in the world, uh, there's always going to be a little bit of post, uh, you know, just a little kind of post fix stuff. And so always having that uh, in mind as I wrap up a project and say, hey, you know, for the next couple of weeks, I'm 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 on call for any issues that come up and we'll do any of those final final fixes. Not to say that I'm just gonna tell people after that you're on your own, <laughs> but you know, at that point then I'm starting to focus deeper on newer projects. Uh, and and then we kind of go back into 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 just sort of general support mode. But uh, yeah, I, Sometimes you just never, in all the testing in the world, you're just not going to find all the weird until you until you get out there. The simpler your site is, the less weird you're going to run into. But yeah, when you get to those enterprise level, heavier heavier lifting websites or you know big e-commerce, we just have to prepare for the fact that there's yeah. some weird. And that's when you're going to have a form and a spreadsheet, and they're going to have to use one or the other. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you're having a good way to kind of track issues afterwards. <laughs> Well, Wendy, we're at the top of the hour. So I want to just yeah. thank you so much for sharing your you know, experience and expertise with everybody out there. And for folks who want to hear more from you, where should they find you? I know right now we don't want to send them to your <laughs> website. We will uh, later they'll have a recap. And when your, when your website is live, we will add a link um, yeah, to your website. So. But in the interim, where should they find you? Uh, well, folks, my email still works. <laughs> Folks can still find me uh, to reach out with questions to wendy at cedarandholly.com. My website will be back up soon at cedarandholly.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn, um, either myself or under Cedar and Holly. You can search for my business or you can find me directly uh, under my name, Wendy Kramer. Uh, or you can also find me on uh, on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, the handle is uh, Cedar and Holly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see everybody here next week. Bye, everyone.